Hello, I'm Daryl Anderson and welcome to episode two of Meat and Livestock Hello. Australia's Feedback TV. I hope you had a great festive season and that you're ready to take 2008 by the horns. Here at Feedback TV, we'll be aiming to help you do that with an easy to watch half hour of stories about research and marketing from your company, MLA. In this episode, we uncover the quest for more profit and less methane from cattle. We encounter the new varieties of lacina, which look like overcoming that vital forage plant's worst insect pest. We open the new publication for goat producers, bringing best practice parasite control together into one place. And we meet Slammin' Sam Kekovich, footy legend and lamb marketing success story four years in a row. So chuck away that remote and stay with us. First up, sheep meat and wool producers have a wealth of technology, knowledge and tools available to them, built on years of industry investment in research and development, as well as their own hard-earned experience on the land. But for a single producer, getting your hands on the right know-how in a quick and straightforward way has never been easy. Well, now there is a way, a new program called Making More From Sheep. It's a joint initiative from MLA and Australian Wool Innovation and it aims to help sheep producers plan and manage their businesses into the future. Dean Allen Craig reports. It's late spring in the New England district and it's all hands on deck as these lambs are drafted from the ewes, ready to be weighed before being sent to market. Andrew Burgess is fourth generation on this picturesque property. Ruby Hills was established in the 1890s and now he and wife Carol Watson run the sheep and beef property near Walker. They're proud of their sheep and their pasture. They've sown a clover and fescue mix for finishing lambs and it survived three successive years of drought. Uh, well, it's a big relief because we thought we'd lost most of it uh, during the drought, but it seemed this particular uh, type of fescue was uh, promoted as being drought tolerant and it looks as though it has done that so uh, we're, uh, we're pretty pleased with that aspect of it. Andrew and Carol believe in the value of taking the time and effort to focus on genetics. A proportion of their self-replacing merino flock is joined to border lesters and then the first cross ewes are crossed with pole dorsets producing second cross lambs for market. You know, you've got to be aware of where your markets are going with, uh, with genetics and try to, uh, to keep up with what's happening and, uh, and supply the market. And quite often the answer to that is, is with genetics. About 250 of Australia's leading sheep, meat and wool producers have helped in the development of this new manual, Making More From Sheep. MLA believes with all the research and development over the years, much of the information, technology and tools needed to maximise production and sustainability already exists, but up until now, it's often been widespread and difficult to access. The Making More From Sheep program, a joint venture between Meat and Livestock Australia and Australian Wool Innovation, is a series of events, courses and a new best practice manual for producers that cover all aspects of meat and wool production, including pasture management, animal health, genetics and farm sustainability. There's even a topic on human resources management and the personal side of living the life of a sheep grazier. It's something that Carol Watson, an ag science graduate, has a special interest in. My interest you know, at the moment is, is the people. I'm looking at doing psychology and I'm interested in um, the relationships between farming families and particularly um, how the family dynamics affect how decisions are made within the family business. Across in South Australia lies the magnificently positioned Tent Rock sheep and cattle property on the Flurio Peninsula. Ben Ryan is also busy weighing and marking lambs for market. Those still underweight will have another month in a paddock full of turnips. Yeah, they'll eat, they'll eat the bulb, the, the tops will go first and then once the tops are gone they'll get the taste for the bulb and they'll pull the bulb out of the ground and eat all of that. The Ryans have chosen Coopworth ewes to build up a self-replacing breeding flock. It's also a part of a long range plan to lower their worm egg count. Well, part of choosing Coopworths was their ability to be fairly resistant or tolerant to worms um, and that's something that we are aware of and, and try to breed for is some some tolerance and also the grazing system that we're using. Um, we um, are trying to sell graze and that gives our pastures long rest periods and I think that 
that's helping with our worm control. Ben Ryan takes a very strategic view of running his farm business, planning ahead for stock numbers to match feed quantities, and researching ways of keeping soils healthy. He's been an advisor for the Making More From Sheep manual. The Ryans are raising three young boys and they've faced the usual battles confronting most farmers. Drought, rising fuel and transport costs, and countless others. But Ben has also had a more personal battle, and one that is not uncommon for people on the land, depression. He urges others who may be struggling with depression to talk about it and seek help. And that, that has been a particularly difficult thing for my family and friends, I guess, in the last couple of years as I've opened up about it and I've had to seek more and more help about it. Um, but it's one that I'm hopefully well into the recovery from, from now. And so I guess my message to other people is that there is, there is hope. Um, you, there are opportunities to get through depression. Seek help. If you're not happy with the help that you're getting, find somebody else. It's, you're not obliged to stay with whoever's assisting you at, at the time. and um, Just don't give up. Ben's had the strong support of his family, but they believe detailed forward planning also helped them get through the worst. I think that a lot of that information is, is available in, in projects like the Making More From Sheep project and it's an opportunity that we have, have in the sheep industry to get better at what we do and take advantage of, of the, the advances that are out there. MLA's Dr Alex Ball has helped coordinate the new manual and believes there's something in it for every sheep producer. The manual's been designed to pull all of that resource and that information together to allow producers to really, with a lot of confidence, a lot of capability, think about what areas are going to impact on their business, what are going to be the critical drivers of their future profitability and, and to bring that all together and, and really sharpen up where they, they think they're going to be for the future. Andrew Burgess is optimistic about the future of Australian farming. The price of food has only got one way to go and that's up. I think farming could become really quite interesting again for a change. <laughs> that's the way I see it happening. Under this microscope are your invisible business partners, converting feed into products your livestock can use to grow. They're microorganisms from the rumen of sheep and cattle. They break down feed, giving off gases, some of which can be used for growth, and others, like methane, are belched out, contributing to climate change. So what does all this hot air mean for the producer? Eventually, agriculture in general and the meat industry included will be brought into a carbon trading system and there will be some sort of tax or penalty associated with carbon emissions and so it will be important for all producers to have an understanding of how much carbon they emit and how they might be able to reduce that. Up to 15% of the feed's energy can be lost as methane so a reduction in emissions could also mean a gain in productivity. That's why CSIRO scientists are studying rumen genomics the genetics of rumen microorganisms to find which microbes produce methane, the methanogens, and which produce other compounds keeping energy in the animal. So what we really need to achieve is a reduction in methane or a suppression of the methanogens while promoting those organisms uh, that actually can utilise the hydrogen in competition with the methanogens. But with billions of microbes to look at, how can you tell the good and bad ones apart? We can now, using a science called metagenomics, extract all the DNA from the rumen and study every organism that's there potentially in terms of the genes that are controlling their function. So now we have the tools to actually understand the rumen at a much more fundamental level and we hope that we can actually manipulate the rumen now more predictably than we could in the past. With rumen genomics we can work out who the good and bad bugs are within the rumen and start barracking for the right team. But what if we could find a team of already trained wonder bugs from a different animal? Kangaroos might hold the key. Their stomachs work in a similar way to those of production animals, yet they don't produce methane. Basically the two types of animals have evolved entirely separately to each other, but along parallel lines. So both have this enlarged um, forestomach, before the 
um, normal gastric stomach, where all the plant material is, is, is kept stored, broken down by bacteria and other microbes. The Department of Primary Industries and Fisheries Queensland have been harvesting kangaroos, sampling their stomach contents and analysing the bugs within. They have discovered that kangaroos have practically no methanogens in their stomachs. From the breakdown of, of the plant material, the important part is to remove hydrogen, which otherwise it would inhibit the fermentation from occurring and you'd get poorer usage of feed. Um, and in cattle and sheep, the way of getting rid of that hydrogen is to produce methane, which is then lost to the atmosphere. But in kangaroos, they produce acetate, which then adds to the pool of energy substrate that's available to the animal. The scientists at CSIRO and the Department of Primary Industries and Fisheries Queensland have the same goal, to change the balance of microbes within the rumen for greater efficiency, production and reduced emissions. In the future, this might be achieved with a supplement, inoculation, drench or some other means of manipulating the microbes. It's a big win for the producer. They're going to uh, uh, get more profits because they're going to get a much more efficient utilisation of the feed resource. At the same time, um, there'll be a reduction in the amount of, of methane that's being generated and, and uh, getting into the atmosphere. MLA is supporting this research as a clever approach to address the issues of climate change whilst continuing to seek greater efficiency and productivity. Now that the environmental, uh, the climate change issue is, is firmly in front of us, uh, this type of approach has the potential to give us uh, a significant gain in productivity as well as address a major issue that the industry faces in terms of reducing its greenhouse gas emissions. The tree legume, Leukina, is a vital forage plant for the beef industry in the tropics of Australia. It's hugely productive fodder, but frustratingly, lots of producers who'd love to grow it simply can't because of one tiny insect. But thanks to MLA-funded plant breeding, that looks set to change. You don't have to have four legs to appreciate the beauty of a lush paddock of Lacina. Six legs will do just nicely, and since the 1980s, this little pain in the neck, known as the psyllid, has devastated Lacina in the tropics around the globe. It's a small sap-sucking bug, about two millimetres uh, in size when it's an adult, and it arrived in Australia in 1986. And it is a particular problem in humid environments where the annual rainfall is over about 800 millimetres. And since it's pretty much a high rainfall plant, that makes for a very restricted growing zone and a massive loss of potential productivity for beef producers and the beef industry. There's a belt between 600 and 800 millimetres of rainfall where over 90% of the lacina is grown in Queensland. But there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is no resistance to psyllids in the lacina species grown for pasture, but the MLA-funded breeding project here at the University of Queensland has managed to bring resistance across from another species of lacina. We have um, now generated plant material that's about 92 or 3% um, lacina leucocephala in our back cross program, and that's the material we're about to plant in the field now and evaluate. And because it's um, got such a high content of lacina leucocephala in it, it's likely to be very genetically stable and ready for release. But not in a hurry. Each new generation takes 18 months. I would hope that seed would be available uh, for cattlemen in about 2011. We'll hopefully finish breeding it next year and uh, then it's a process of actually delivering seed to commercial seed producers in Queensland, getting them to grow it on, bulk up seed so we've got tonne quantities in the shed that can be sold to, to um, producers. One beef producer who's practically counting the sleeps until the new varieties are available is MLA Chairman Don Heatley. He's been grazing irrigated lacina in North Queensland for about seven years. And as you might imagine, psyllids are one of his pet hates. Some years you'll have very low infestation. 
the next year it could be quite heavy and you might have a couple of months where they really bother you. Mm. So, you know, you'll probably lose a month, you know, on average, just where you don't have the quality of feed in front of the, uh, in front of the livestock. Even with that handicap, Lakina has utterly transformed the Heatley family's operation. You know, broadly speaking, we've halved our age of turnoff. I mean, we've got other properties where we've got grass-fed bullocks coming out of those, and they're that sort of three, three and a half years old. These cattle here, uh, we're doing them now um, at about sort of 22 months of age thereabouts. Um, milk to four teeth is the maximum. We've got a lot of cattle, milk teeth and two teeth now, and they're, they're dressing out at that sort of that Jap Ox 290, 300 kgs or better. So it's a, it's a very, very productive system in that regard. For those who have been involved, particularly in dryland Lakeening, which Lakina, which is uh, where the bulk of the pasture lies in Queensland, particularly in the central Queensland area, um, I mean, the gains to the industry as a whole have been enormous. And with Sillard resistant Lakina, the gains will push beyond the current narrow band where Lakina can grow. Well, that's an exciting prospect. It does present a bit of a challenge. Lakina has the potential to be an environmental pest. Now, the industry keeps that under control through a code of practice. But as Lakina goes into whole new areas, that code of practice is going to have to go along with it. Ensuring that happens will be the role of the Lakina Growers Group, known as the Lakina Network. If you adhere to a code of practice, which the network, ha the Lakina Network has in place, then you're not going to see the spread of, uh, of, of plant outside its boundaries. So it's, uh, it's important to be involved and understand, but it's, uh, it's an exciting prospect, this, this new variety. And I, I would encourage anybody who possibly can or thinking about becoming involved in growing Lakina or wants to understand the basics is to become a member. It's, it's very, very cheap and there's a mountain of information. And the best part about the information is it's, it's, it's free in the sense that people like myself and others, have, you know, we've, we've made the mistakes and we're, we're willing to talk about it. So that's a great advantage in itself. In fact, it was via the Lakina network that producers initiated MLA's investment in the breeding program, an investment of $620,000 that now seems certain to yield a massive return. One of Australia's most influential food TV programs is Fresh TV, targeted squarely at grocery buyers. For nearly eight years, the show has showcased simple, honest cooking with fresh Australian produce, and red meat is regularly given the Fresh TV treatment. That hasn't happened by chance. MLA's sponsorship of Fresh TV is an important part of MLA's consumer marketing. Here's a sample, and you might even want to try it yourself. So we're doing a stir fry, a beef quay tau. First thing you need to know is your wok needs to be really nice and hot. We've got some oyster sauce. Mm -hmm. You want about a quarter of a cup of that. And then we're gonna have a couple of tablespoons of kekup manis. Mm -hmm. And out here we didn't have uh, Chinese cooking wine or sherry, so we've got a little bit of stock we're gonna put in. Let's put a teaspoon of sambal olic in, or crushed chilies. And then some garlic. Mm -hmm and I'll get you to grate that ginger. Great, so that's the sauce for our stir fry. So here, a little bit of oil in here. Now the key thing is, we don't want the beef to stew, so just put half of it in at a time and just keep right it on. moving. Here we go. I've got a green capsicum I'd already sliced up and a red capsicum. We need to put the beef back in. This is really your flavouring. Pop that in, put in with the noodles. There we go, some <laughs> coriander on the top. Terrific. Look at so, that, Marley, beautiful. you're a star. And we already knew you were. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on Fresh. Thank you. If there was ever any doubt about the importance of live export to the economy of regional Australia, an independent report recently settled the question once and for all. It showed that if the trade were halted, six regions of Australia would lose more than $2.5 billion over 10 years. Surely a devastating blow. 
One of the main threats to the trade is animal welfare concerns surrounding treatment of sheep and cattle when they arrive at their destination. Well, a 34-year-old mum from Canamble in New South Wales is spearheading efforts to allay those concerns by training livestock handlers in the Middle East to handle and care for Aussie sheep. Sally Moore reports. Rounding sheep in the small Arab state of Bahrain, it seems a world away from Canamble, New South Wales and all the trimmings of Australian farm life, but this is where Sharon Dundon and her husband Peter have chosen to base themselves, passing on their Aussie expertise to Middle Eastern stockmen, vets and people who work with Australian animals. All the training we do from the ships to the ports to the trucks in the feedlots and also at slaughterhouses, we're just trying to lead by example just by demonstrating good techniques, um, low stress animal handling techniques, so that uh, the sheep are looked after and, so it, and, and it's easier for the people as well. The Dundons are part of Australia's presence in the Middle East. MLA's and Live Corp's Livestock Export Program is a long-term initiative, with improving animal welfare a priority for destination countries in this region and Southeast Asia. We have research and development going on to continually improve the trade. Uh, we also now have put a big focus on working in the marketplace, uh, training and educating not only those people who receive our livestock and handle them, but also their managers and the principals of the companies they work for uh, in an attempt to show them that improving animal welfare not only improves uh, their workers' conditions, but improves their business profit. And it's paying dividends. Thanks to the program, Middle Eastern stockmen better understand how to handle Australian sheep, which is having significant quality and, of course, welfare benefits. You can see the sheep behind us here look fit, healthy, have travelled really well. We're investing significant amounts of money here in training and working with people that are receiving our sheep. And we're making some big changes and we've had some significant gains over the last five to ten years. The industry has made steady improvements in the standards of the day-to-day -day care of animals throughout the export process. More than 99% of sheep and 99.9% .9 of cattle who boarded a boat in Australia successfully disembarked at their destination. No other country has offered such training or education in this region, so without our expertise and presence, standards here would certainly drop and the void would be filled by countries who don't share Australia's animal welfare focus. A drawback critics of the trade may not take into account. If they're not here doing it, no one's doing it. And the, the only way in which animal welfare standards for Australian livestock will continue to be improved here in the region, and for livestock more generally, is for those people funded by Australian farmers to remain here with our livestock, improving conditions. The process is gradual. After all, the program is up against centuries-old traditions. But MLA and Live Corp staff say there is still a responsibility to make sure Aussie animals are treated kindly and fairly in the marketplace. Improving animal welfare and standards in places like the Middle East is certainly worth our effort. Livestock exports contribute around $1.8 billion to the Australian economy. And for many of the 13,000 people it employs, it is their bread and butter, particularly those in remote areas where livestock exports are the lifeblood of communities. Clearly this is a, a very vital market, one that uh, a range of suppliers will produce for, and one that Australia has done an enormous amount of work over many years to pioneer, nurture and continue to develop. In the meantime, the Dundons are brushing up on their Arabic and continuing their work to improve the welfare of animals in the Middle East. Australia's goat meat industry is fast developing a greater critical mass of producers who are concerned with flock management rather than just with opportunistic harvesting of ferals. Now that's led to a growing emphasis on parasite control in the industry. Well, goat producers hungry for tools and information on that subject had several things to celebrate recently. Jane Drinkwater reports. It's been an issue for goat producers for many years. With few goat drenches available, how do you control parasites while making sure drench resistance doesn't become a major problem? 
That's why MLA has developed new publications outlining strategies goat producers should use to manage parasites. And if the reaction at the launch in Toowoomba is anything to go by, then it seems the material, which includes a new module for the Going Into Goats guide, could give producers some additional ideas. This publication that MLA has just released for the Going Into Goats guide uh, is going to be a crucial reference for producers. It brings together all the uh, chemical and non-chemical control strategies and prevention strategies that goat producers can use. The 24-page module and toolkit details how to get the most out of chemicals, including a caution against drenching during overly dry periods. Non-chemical strategies include providing plenty of browse, culling underperforming goats and involving cattle in paddock rotation strategies. Probably with our parasite control, our biggest step has been to cull ruthlessly any non-doer, non-performer. It's always important to consider the preventative measures first. The release of MLA's publications coincided with the launch of Capramec from Verbac, a drench extensively trialled and tested on goats, which means producers can have increased confidence in the effectiveness of dosing levels and greater assurance they're fulfilling their obligations regarding residue levels. To have a sustainable industry in Australia, we need to be mindful of our markets and we need to produce a product that's suitable for those markets. What's absolutely not suitable are residues. So to have chemicals that are registered for use is vitally important given that 95% of Australia's goat meat is, is exported. There hasn't been a, a broad range of um, chemicals available as with uh, cattle and sheep. So Verbac particularly have gone, come along um, of recent and developed a new drench for the goat industry, um, Capramec, which is an ML drench. It's a different compound to the other drenches that are available, so it, it works on the parasites in a different way. Um, it also starts to work on a broader range of parasites. The launch of a new goat-specific parasite drench has been welcomed by producers as a step forward for the industry. But registration of products from further chemical groups is needed if chemical strategies are to remain effective in the long term. What we are hoping is that chemical companies look at the goat industry and see that it has grown and hopefully they will see that it's a viable prospect for them to enter the goat industry. And through that we may see some more interest and some more classes of drenches registered. Regardless of whether additional goat specific drenches come onto the market, it's clear that producers need to use a multi-stranded approach to parasite control. It's crucial that producers adopt grazing management, non-chemical strategies to combat parasites. A chemical drench can be rendered useless so easily by improper use uh, and therefore people need to be aware of that. They need to use it according to best practice and they certainly need to integrate the use of that chemical with grazing management strategies. Grazing management has been a key tactic at David and Mary Booth's goat enterprise at Cootamundra. We've um, taken a, a strategy of sort of controlled grazing or grazing management, looking at the condition of our animals and uh, trying to keep uh, pasture length up, uh, moving them onto fresh, longer feed. The chemical and non-chemical strategies outlined in MLA's new publications provide further tools goat producers can use to increase their productivity, ultimately helping Australia maintain its position as the world's leading exporter of goat meat. So if parasites are getting on your goat, maybe now's a good time to reassess and take an integrated approach to parasite management. That export trade in goat meat is now worth close on $100 million to the Australian economy, an increase of about 400% in 10 years. Amazing. Now, a bit about our location. We're at Tokal Agricultural College's campus near Newcastle in New South Wales. And for more than 40 years, this has been one of Australia's most important educational institutions for the livestock industries. Young people with their eyes on a career on the land come here fresh out of school and leave a year or two later with vital practical skills. 
kick around the cattle and sheep properties of New South Wales, Queensland, the Territory and beyond for any length of time and you'll find plenty of Tokal graduates doing everything from jackarooing to signing the cheques. The site has buildings dating from as early as the 1830s, including a barn designed by one of Australia's first great architects, Edmund Blackett, and college buildings from the 1960s by a young Philip Cox, now one of Australia's most celebrated contemporary architects. Coming up, grain for fuel versus grain for food production. MLA Managing Director David Palmer on this and other pressing issues, but now looking forward. MLA's latest projections for red meat supply and demand and a look at how they're made. Feedback Magazine, this issue, has a summary of MLA's annual industry projections. While the strong outlook for Australian red meat in 2008 is a story worth reading, the story of how MLA reaches those conclusions has its own value. It's an exercise of, of bringing together um, uh, information from uh, various sources from around Australia, from around the world. Um, but critical to it uh, is the direct contact that we have uh, with our stakeholders, the producers. The process culminates in an industry workshop of all sectors. Processors, feedlotters, exporters and producers, large and small, gather to contribute their insight about market and seasonal conditions. It's a good process. I mean, we've got all sectors of the industry covered. We all get a say and uh, we all hear what everyone else says and at the end of the day hopefully we've got something that's pretty close to what might happen and at least it, it's something that producers can read and they can sort of say well yep that makes sense to me I might go this way in my business. It's a process which gives the projections huge credibility as the key to making strategic production and marketing decisions. In our business, this sort of information coming in is, is really um, letting us see what direction the industry is going as far as export markets that might be increasing, export markets that might be decreasing, seeing how the domestic market shifting, um, you know, talking about consumer focus, what, what are they thinking about these days compared to 10 years ago, all these little things can mean a change in, in what we do and what we target um, with our livestock. Looking at uh, cattle on feed, for example, in the US markets, um, the timing of when those should be exiting feedlots, feedlots and going onto um, uh, international markets, that enables us to try and plan our year to optimise our sales so that we're not selling when everybody else is selling um, and, and hopefully that uh, you know, proves financially beneficial for us. The 2008 projections factor in a break in the drought, not unreasonable with current climate indicators. For beef, the only real negatives that leaves are the high value of the Australian dollar and renewed competition in Japan and Korea from the US after a forced absence of four years. While MLA expects that to impact Australian exports, the Americans won't find it easy going. They've found it tough so far. They're back into Japan, but uh, they've only about a 10% of their previous supply at this stage. Uh, I think they're going to find it tough not just because the protocols are reasonably tight, uh, but also because there's still consumer resistance uh, in the market and they do like Australian products. So I think, I think the, our share is going to be, remain uh, much higher than what it was previously, but we will suffer some uh, impact in the next 12 months. For lamb, 2007 saw the national flock shrink further to barely half the size of 1990 and the lowest number of sheep in the country since 1924. Despite that, there was record lamb production of 425,000 tonnes. Not that incomes were higher, feed costs soared to that. But in the coming year, with a better season bringing down production costs, lamb seems set for a strong year. Uh, the industry is going to be very close again in the coming year to record production. It'll be down a bit, but it'll still close second highest probably on record. Uh, we'll have... Uh, uh, demand uh, on export markets higher than we've ever seen before in the next 12 months despite uh, a high Australian dollar uh, and providing we do get the, uh, the breaking uh, of the drought we're going to see the cost of production come right back down uh, for land producers and we'll see a further shift I think um, of producers into land production uh, so I think we're looking at a, a pretty positive year for lamb in uh, 2008.
the memory of 2007's record grain prices will linger. And with ethanol production adding to global demand for grain, the cost of feeding livestock, especially during drought, is looming as one of the major issues facing the industry in the long term. I put that issue to MLA Managing Director David Palmer. David, thanks for joining Feedback TV once again. Yeah, great to be here. Given the competition for grain from the fuel sector for producing ethanol, that's driving grain prices up. Is that the greatest challenge faced by the red meat sector at this point in time? Uh, I, at the moment, I, I see we've got four or five major issues. The industry historically has always had one or two, but now we've got you know, a whole collection that we haven't had previously. And this whole contest between food and fuel over this renewable plant resource for ethanol is just one of five. Um, I've said for some time that I don't think Australia can produce both food and fuel. We've got a choice, but we can't do both. The vagaries of the seasons, the very stringent quarantine conditions makes grain and the availability a very precious commodity in this country. So I don't think we can do both. But at the moment, the price has gone to new levels we've never seen previously. It's a bit to do with the drought, but I think it's got more to do with international pricing. Uh, the wheat crop in America this year plummeted at the expense of corn, big corn acreages, of which now the crop in America has gone from 12% to 25% for ethanol production. But these things will settle down. You know, we're not going to get $400 wheat for long, but where it ends up, I just don't know. You made the point at the AGM in November that most of Australia's beef and lamb goes into the four high value markets that we have. Now, is that a dangerous position? Do we need to diversify or would diversification of our markets simply be for its own sake? Yes, no, I don't see it as a problem, I just it's reality. And as you just said, the four markets in question, Australia, which is our largest and most loyal market, uh, Japan, Korea and the United States, just happen to be the four highest priced markets around uh, and our volume. The, uh, however, it is important for us and for, and for our processor, meat exporters and processor colleagues, to be continually on the lookout for new markets, new opportunities. We've talked about Russia in recent times. It's a market that's sort of come out of the world, as it were, or come out of the wood. Uh, the Europeans have been not able to fill their quota. Uh, Brazil has been sort of brought back a bit because of some, some disease issues, as has uh, the United States. There are increased retail prices for beef and lamb uh, uh, at the supermarket, yet producers really aren't seeing that converted to that extent into what they receive on farm. Why is that? Because of the vagaries of the seasons, because of our failed spring, uh, because of the onset of what could be a long hot summer, uh, producers have not been good holders, have not been able to hold stock. So then supply has now exceeded demand and the laws take over and consumer dollar splits are heading elsewhere on the chain, um, as regrettable as it is. Now how do we overcome that at the company? MLA's role in all this is to drive awareness. We've got to, divide, to drive awareness both on the domestic market and in overseas markets, which hopefully stimulates competition. It stimulates competition from consumers who are looking in their repertoire for beef, lamb, fish, poultry, pork, etc., and that they might turn to red meat because the awareness is strong. And equally in the retail sector, we've got to continue to stimulate retail outlets, working with supermarkets, working with the high street butcher, the normal butcher all around town. And there are many thousands of butcher shops who are all great people to work with and have got some very innovative ideas. So it's about stimulating competition at retail, stimulating food service to drive for a high awareness so that beef and lamb is uppermost in consumers' minds when they're deciding on tonight's meal. But in, in addition to that, I'm afraid we will never influence the base laws of supply and demand. David Palmer, thanks once again for joining us on Feedback TV. Good, Daryl. Thank you. Aussie rules legend and straight talker Sam Kekovic has been the face of MLA's extraordinarily successful Australia Day lamb campaign for four years running. Was lamb the traditional Australia Day food before that time? Not really. Is it now? You bet. Sally Moore takes us behind the scenes of this year's ad to look at the making of a great Aussie tradition. Right out, let's go. <laughs> Sally's 
straight-faced and about as politically incorrect as you can get. It's hard to know just how to take Sam Kekovic. Through that camera, you can feed him and shove it. <laughs> There's little difference between the man you meet and the personality he portrays each year during his now infamous Australia Day address to the nation. What could be more Australian than that? MLA lamb campaigns are deliberately attention-seeking and cheeky to get as many consumers as possible talking about lamb and serving it up to the family. Over the past four years, the partnership between Slam and Sam and Australian Lamb has fueled extensive media coverage, far exceeding the levy funds invested in making the ad. Sam's script never fails to spark outrage in those who bear the brunt of his ramblings, and yet it's still not enough to force the big man to mince his words on or off the camera. Well, of course not. I'm a proud Australian. What have we got to fear? And it's obvious Sam doesn't need much convincing when it comes to the product he's spruiking. It's succulent, juicy, it is just the most, it is the most quintessential meal that anyone can serve. Nor is he backward in coming forward about his thoughts on the Aussie farmer. He's really done it tough, but he's displayed all the wonderful virtues of being Australian. He hasn't whinged or moaned, he's rolled up his sleeve. And if past Sam Kekovic ads are anything to go by, you can expect lamb sales will go through the roof this year. An extra 3.5 million lamb serves landed on Australian plates each week on average in the month after last year's campaign. And the extra publicity surrounding its hype was worth almost $5 million. Look at the so, what the is the secret Take of his off. success? Ah, now you're probing very, very deep, my dear girl. You want me to reveal my... If I was to do that, you know where lamb sales would be soaring to? An unprecedented level. But that is already on the cards now that Sam Kekovic has once again unleashed his torrent of abuse. We get flung off every TV station. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly an option. After all, it's a winning formula. Well, now that we've seen what happens behind the scenes, let's take a look at this year's Australia Day lamb ad in full. My fellow Australians, it is my solemn duty to inform you that it's time to abolish Australia Day. Our annual lamb fest hasn't stopped on Australianism racing through the land like horse flew through a Japanese jockey club. For example, if I see another binge drinking, pill popping, powder sniffing footballer making a tearful television apology, I'll blow a fuse. Australia Day has had its day. We need Australia Week, a seven day lambathon, to properly celebrate our great nation. Instead of one public holiday, we need seven. Instead of one lamb barbie, we need 21 lamb meal opportunities, not including snacks. Which imbecile thought one day was long enough anyway? Look at the Olympics, Oktoberfest, the Turkish Oil Wrestling Festival. Even APEC gets a week. And that's just a bunch of blokes in funny shirts. Apart from Helen Clark, who does a passable impersonation of a bloke anyway. The placard waving, police bashing weed worshippers made protest about it. But it's nothing a few blasts from a water cannon can't fix. They could do with a wash. And if they're still too un Australian to chop a few chops with the rest of us, Send them to Nauru. The Refugee Processing Centre has plenty of palm trees they can hug. I'll be petitioning our new PM to officially recognise Australia Week. If you still call Australia home, stack the fridge full of lamb. Take the week off and celebrate with me. Any boss that won't let you is a bum. Just chuck a week of sickies instead. What could be more Australian than that? So don't be un-Australian. Serve lamb this Australia Week. You know it makes sense. I'm Sam Kekovic. Well, Sam certainly isn't short of an opinion, is he? But his is not the only one. As we leave you, what do consumers think? Sam hits the streets to get the opinions that really count. And remember, we'd love to hear your opinion too on any of the stories in this episode. We hope you've enjoyed the show, but from Feedback TV, it's bye for now. The lady just walked up to the counter and ordered lamb, did you not? Lamb tenderloins for the baby. Lamb tenderloins for the baby. Yeah. Now, all you do-gooders and vegetarians out there who've always suggested that lamb chops are not good for the well-being and the healthy development of a young bambino, have a look if you've ever seen a, a healthier bambino than this. Lamb is its staple diet, you fools out there. Well done, Mum. Oh, the lamb man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You like lamb? Love it. I'm just uh, getting a petition signed to celebrate Australia Week instead of Australia Day. Would you support that? I'll support any of the news, so. Thank you very much. And how many lambs do you reckon lamb chops or lamb products you'd bowl over in a week? About 30. 30, good. Yeah. Do you have a barbecue regularly? Certainly do. That's the Australian yeah. spirit. Yeah. Thank Would you be in favour of having a whole week off for Australia Day? <laughs> yeah, why not? Big groovy. Yes. The, and now lamb, you obviously enjoy lamb. Um, yes. What is, what's I your favourite yes, cut? I? No, you don't have to say <laughs> yes. 
But lamb cutlet or a lamb chop or just a big roast leg? What's your favourite? Um, everyone loves a roast. Do you have a barbie? Yes. What do you put on your barbie? How many chops do you reckon you'd go through in a week if you had the whole week off? Oh, thousands. Thousands. So you'd have no hesitation to sign my petition to have a whole week of Australia yeah, Day sure. celebrating yeah. lamb. Yep. Definitely. You're a darling. Give me a kiss. <laughs> mm. <laughs>